Yo, yo, yo. I'm going to go to the Trans YouTube channel. I'm going to go to the blog, She Loves the Gloves, author and MMA journalist. And I'm going to go to the surprise. I'm going to the UFC Summer's Row, Ilya Topuri, Max Holwist, and I'm going to go to the Trend Rest, which is 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 the Trend Rest. The man, the myth, the legend. Ladies and gentlemen, from one capital city to another, today we have a very special guest. The golden standard when it comes to MMA coverage and uh, fight breakdowns. The one half of award-winning duo of Morning Combat and the man who is mostly responsible for uh, the majority of stuff that I pretend to know about MMA. <laughs> the one and only Luke Thomas. Luke, welcome and thank you for doing this. Yeah, very generous introduction, and if it makes you feel better, I pretend to know what I'm doing as well. <laughs> hey, fake it till you make it. Exactly right. Well, Luke, first of all, how are you doing? How are, you, how are things in D.C.? Are you guys preparing for Halloween already? Yeah, my daughter's five, so as you can imagine, we are in the thick of, um, you know, everyone has to participate in Halloween. We are very excited and my daughter is going as princess peach from mario brothers this gosh year. um i remember you mentioning something about wanting to go as a chewbacca how did that go did not go over well my <laughs> daughter ultimately found the we 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 went to and tried on some costumes and uh she found them very like a little too scary and so i had to go with uh i'll be mario <laughs> Hey, how many lives do you get? I don't know. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to make it work with the one I have. I hope you make it count, you know. Well, uh, we have a lot to get to, so I guess we should just r uh, jump right into it. Uh, of course, UFC 308 is finally upon us, and uh, the card, I mean, it's probably one of the most stacked cards of the entire year. But obviously, we would like to focus today on the main event, uh, which personally for me is my Roman Empire, basically. You know, uh, it's a fight that I've been dreaming about ever since Ilya beat uh, Josh Emmett. And even if we just forget that for a second, right? It's the first ever UFC Georgian, Georgian champion uh, defends his featherweight title for the first time against arguably one of the best uh, fighters in that that division has ever known, really, Max Holloway. On a scale of one to, through 10, am I crazy or are you just excited about this fight as I am? Yeah, it's a 10, it's a 10. Um, it's the best fight that can be made in all of MMA. Uh, I personally believe that. Now there's some close seconds. It's not like the runaway first, but it's the first. Uh, and for me, I mean, um, the reason's pretty obvious. Max Holloway is not just an all-time great at 145, but I wouldn't say it's his best win ever, but it's coming off of one of his best wins ever, which just happened to be a weight class up. And the reason why that's important is because he flatlined the guy. I'm, I'm assuming some of the audience may or may not know this. They do. And <laughs> Yeah, and but just to reiterate, we're talking about a guy whose power – carried up to 55 and he flatlined somebody and the reason why all that's actually kind of important is not just that it shows you know that he has a considerable ability which we already knew or that you know he's very very good which we already knew but like the thing that was kind of interesting was I spoke to Max Holloway's coaches following that win at UFC 300 over Justin Gaethje and one thing that they were really stressed was that the losses that he has had to Alexander Volkanovsky and then just in general He's been really trying to work on his power, and you saw evidence of that in that fight with Gaethje at 155. So that's one half of the equation. You've got an all-time great who's coming off of a sensational knockout win up a weight class uh, who basically hasn't lost to anybody, really, uh, at 145 except Volkanovski. And then on the other side of the equation, you have Ilya Teporia, who, in my mind, is maybe the most electric talent in all of MMA. Again, that's somewhat debatable or preference-based. But for me, he's my number one. Like, like when I think of who's appointment viewing in MMA, Ilya Teporia is at the very, very top of that list. And the reasons for that are quite obvious as well. He has dynamite power in both of his hands. He is super well-rounded. Um, he is very young, relatively speaking, anyway, and just... It seems like a natural for the game coming off of his best win where he dethroned Volkanovsky inside of a round and a half and did, doing it in very, very thorough fashion, basically, ultimately in the end. And so you have this collision at 145 between two guys who are obviously at the very top of the game, but it's for a belt. Max Holloway is completely, re it seems like completely rejuvenated versus Deporia, who is surging 
in the most, you know, undeniable of ways. And they're both super well-rounded, super talented. Like if you like MMA, I generally, I don't know how to, I don't know how to look at this bout and be like, oh, it's, it doesn't fulfill what I want. This has everything an MMA fan could ever possibly want. Uh, it's, it's the best. Yeah, for sure. This is what the dreams are made of. <laughs> uh, but actually, one of the reasons why I personally wanted to see this fight for so long is when I look at both of them, right? Again, apart from everything that you've already mentioned, which was great, the way that they match up with each other, it just, for me, it just presents such a unique puzzle, which I personally don't really know how to solve. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, after the fight is over and we know all the, you know, results, I'll be like, yeah, probably was obvious. I should have known that. So I just, I would like to kind of hear your take on how you see this fight playing out. Well, I wouldn't rule out the ground, but it doesn't seem like the ground would be the most likely place. Frankly, for either guy, Ilya is good there. And I would say Max is surprisingly good there. And at a bare minimum, has very good takedown defense. It just seems like you don't want to rule that out because every time you think like, oh, that will never happen, then it goes and happens. <laughs> so what I try to do is assign probability to something. I would say that the ground is a, is a probably a fairly low probability. And so you have to ask how it's going to go on the feet. This is the interesting part about it. If both guys like to lead, but one more so than the other, which would be Taporia. Taporia is much more of a hunter in there, uh, in part because he's obviously very skilled, in part because he's very heavy-handed, and I think he genuinely believes, I just need enough time on the clock, and I can I can put most of these guys away. And up to this point, he's been quite correct. I think what I, I – I'll tell you what I'm looking for, what I think – like where the central tensions are – if Ilya is going to be leading, then what I'm expecting him to do is to find ways to corral Max's movement. But if you actually pay attention to how, what Max is good at, it's movement. Max is good at uh, not so much heavy lateral movement, but definitely circling. If you go back and you watch both Jose Aldo fights, he circles one direction the entire time the first fight. And then the second fight, he goes the opposite direction. So he's turning the guy all the time and then does it the other way. One of the most brilliant kind of like one, two game plans I think I've ever seen, frankly. And by the way, stopped Jose Aldo back to back doing that. Those would be his most impressive wins. And so you have to ask yourself, what is Ilya going to do to counteract that? Also, Max has a ridiculous chin. I think he's going to need it because I do think that he gets hit um, a fair amount. And, dude, against a dominant puncher like Taporia, I you know no one's ever really even knocked him down, much less knocked him out. And Taporia is claiming he's going to like put his lights out like that. You know, it's hard. It's hard for me to even imagine that happening, but it is absolutely on the table. And so the question is, to what extent can Max weather Taporia's punching power? Also, who's going to win the battle of the jabs? I think the person who can really establish their jab and their rhythm off of the jab is, is going to take this fight ultimately to the end. The kind of X factors that are interesting are, does Taporia go for a takedown? Because he is very, very good there. He has heavy ground and pound. Also, what about Max's kicking game? You saw a few leg kicks, but more importantly, you saw some of those spinning kicks that he would lead Justin Gaethje into. I think that can mix things up uh, as well. The last thing I'd point out is if Max decides to accept pressure, which, by the way, could happen. He did that against Volkanovski in their second fight, which was also a very close contest then you want to look for out for Max's uh, knees as Taporia enters because Taporia does a lot of level changing like this and to, you know, faking the takedown or at least faking the level change. And there's a height difference between them. And so, uh, you know, you think about Dan Hooker versus Gilbert Burns or something like that, where if one person's really tall and one person's not, they can use their knees on an intercepting lower level opponent quite frequently. And that, so that's something I'm paying attention for. And by the way, Taporia has been rocked in the Jai Herbert fight, but then he came back and knocked the guy out and looked like he was cutting him in half. It was so brutal. So these are some of the fault lines that I'm kind of paying attention to. But the big one, the big takeaway for me is who can control for the other's real estate? That and the jab are really where the fight's going to be won and lost. Probably one lesson that everyone took from the Volkanovski fight, obviously the fights before that, but I think it was very apparent in the Volkanovski fight with Topuria, uh, is that you just cannot get caught behind the line with this guy. If he catches you too close to the fence, it's it's just it's a matter of time. He likes to make to use those long combinations, and there's just no way out. I, I want to see how Max is going to kind of solve for that particular you know part of the equation. Uh, but apart from that, what would you say uh, is kind of a wild? 
card in this fight. Do you think a car cardio wow. cardio may play play a role? Because I mean, Topuria has a five round experience, but that was against Josh Emmett, and that was mostly done on Ilya's terms. I don't think whether Max will allow that for twenty five minutes. So one thing, I mean, again, they have different abilities, some better, some worse. Um, but the one thing that Max clearly has in his favor, and this also works against him a little bit, but it let me just get it out, which is like, if there's one thing you can say about Holloway, he is battle tested fully, unquestionably, no doubt about it, battle tested, fought Jose Aldo twice, fought Volkanovsky three times, fought Dustin Poirier twice. I mean, he has been in the trenches, three round fights, five round fights, guys who were strikers, guys who were grapplers. It did not matter. He has seen virtually everything that MMA has to offer. Taporia has not. Taporia has not. He is obviously very skilled and didn't get to this position in any way that's accidental, but he doesn't have the experience that Max does. Now, I mentioned that there's a bit of a downside there. Max has taken an enormous amount of damage and has shown, to be clear, this is not an exaggeration, one of the most legendary chins in MMA. At the same time, like eventually that dam breaks. Eventually it does, and you're going up against just, I cannot overstate, like a dynamite puncher. And one more thing about Taporia, he's not just a dynamite puncher. Like a lot of guys have heavy hands uh, in various weight classes, a little less so at 145. I think Taporia is the hardest hitter at 145 by a mile. But more than that, he is very accurate. He's very, very accurate, and he has good combination punching. You mentioned that before. Like, what's one of Taporia's best punches? To me, it's his left hook to the liver. His left hook to the liver is absolutely devastating, and if that doesn't polish you off, then the right hand that comes behind it typically does. The Damon Jackson fight is a great example of that. So, you know, when I think about this, it's like if the fight goes into the third, into the fourth, right, and Taporia has, like, hit him with the kitchen sink, and let's say Holloway doesn't go down, what does Taporia do? Does he center himself and realize, okay, I'm just in this one for the long haul and I got to continue to apply a diligent game plan? Maybe. Does he get discouraged? Maybe. We don't know. I simply don't know. This is the point I'm trying to make. I think Taporia's greatness, and I mean this quite sincerely. I'm not even saying this because I'm talking to a Georgian <laughs> uh, media outlet. I mean, I mean this quite sincerely. I think his greatness has not been fully shown to us yet. Um, and I suspect we'll get a better look at it against Max. But... I don't know that. These are unresolved questions. And that as that fight goes long, you mentioned cardio, but also to some of the mental battles you have to win against a guy who simply, you know, against other people has not gone away. These how he deals with that is a big, a big lesson. We'll see. Yeah, for sure. And what better op opponent to test that against than Max Holloway, really? Uh, but about, about greatness, yeah, I completely agree, honestly, because uh, a coworker of mine the other day said this phrase, which kind of stuck with me. He was like, I don't think we really truly realize how great this guy is. And I was like, yeah, 100%, because it's one of those things that before you see it, it's really hard to imagine. I mean, Alex Volkanovsky is one of the greatest fighters walking the face of this planet, really. And of course, when you know one of your guys or one of your countrymen goes into a battle with a guy like that, you of course are nervous. But at the same time, just to see how he did what he did. I mean, he struggled, struggled a little bit with the jab, I think. That would be fair to say against Volkanovsky, I mean Ilya. But in the end, just the way that fight ended, it was kind of one of those monumental moments, really, when you kind of watch this fallen king kind of and this new contender and the new king, uh, you know, claiming his thrones. And I mean, all the respect for Ma Max Holloway. Again, yeah, we are a Georgian outlet, but Max Holloway is one of my favorite fighters. So I like to joke that no matter what happens in this fight, I will be a little bit heartbroken. Let me add something to that, if I may, which is I totally agree with you about Max. Max is a credit to the game, and um, it's been an honor to cover his career. And he might win. Like this is this is you know he's a very very tough customer. But one thing about Ilya that I again this is my hunch. I don't know if this is true, but this is what I feel is true. Partly he doesn't have like he you know Max is much Max has been doing this for much longer, so he's just got a lot more experience. But one thing that should give I think anybody who's a Taporia fan or Georgians in general some comfort is, how old is Taporia, like 27, 27. 28, something 27. like that? 27. Right? 27, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So if you, don't re if you haven't been watching MMA very long, let me tell you about the age of 27. 27 is one of these ages where if somebody's good, and obviously at this point it's very easy to declare Taporia at a bare minimum is, is quite good, um, this is when they begin to show you the quantum leaps in their game. 
right? So you see little touches of it at 23 and 24. Even when they get a little bit older, 33, 34, they can add some interesting little tricks or have a new game plan about things. But 27 is right when they begin to take these huge leaps over time. And, you know, what's kind of interesting is this isn't always the case with Taporia, but if you go back to the Volkanovsky fight, for example, I went back and I looked at this. On all three judges' scorecards, he lost the first round to Volkanovsky, but then he polished him off in the second. But why? I got real Gervonta Tank Davis vibes from him. Tank Davis is a guy in boxing who also a dominant puncher, right? At the, the lower weight classes, 135 or so. And But what he does is he'll often lose the first three, four rounds against guys because he's trying to look and see what they do, test their power, how they move, what they react to. And then once he gets a beat on it, he just moves downhill on them and they just go away. That's exactly what you got out of Tapori against Volkanovsky. He did lose the first round quite, quite, you know, it wasn't like a beating or anything, but he lost it. But what he was doing was he was establishing rhythms. He was establishing patterns. And if you go back and look, uh, the way in which he was able to back him up to the fence was he showed him a look that Volkanovsky had interpreted it as meaning one thing, but then after uh, seeing it several times, but then Taporia switched it at the last minute and did that all to close distance, which then pushed Volkanovsky back to the fence, made him square, and that's when he got hit with the gigantic shot over the top. My point being is this is a guy who has only shown you small bits of brilliance like that I think a guy like Max, whether he wins or loses, is going to bring some of that out and give us, if nothing else, a much better look at who Taporia and the, what the full breadth of his game is. Um, I tend to think that you're going to see that, and I also think you're going to see him take a gigantic step up at UFC 308. Sure, hope so, really. And the funniest thing about this guy is, is that he was originally a grappler and it was something that Eugene Behrman also mentioned to me you know when I asked him about what he thought about Topuri before we uh before the fight Volk with Volkanovsky ever happened and he was like he got so good at striking that everyone keeps forgetting that this guy is predominantly a grappler that when he came to the UFC everybody was like do not let him take you to the ground and we are talking about him again you're making parallels with Gervonta Davis you know well while, while the guy is a black belt. I mean, I understand that MMA has developed over the last decades, I guess, and we do get a lot of well-rounded guys, but to get a guy that is so good at so many facets, I mean, that is quite fascinating, right? He's unusual for that reason, and he entered the UFC as a black belt. I mean, that, that to me is the part that's interesting, right? Because you go back and you look at some of his earlier fights, and he fought some of those in like the apex or whatever, and you could tell he's heavy-handed, but you know, his feet are kind of all over the place, his balance is a little bit disrupted. He looked like a grappler who was still learning to strike, but he was still athletic enough and the ground was always where he could take things. You know what I mean? Like he was like, oh, I guess striking is a bit of a bonus. But the point I'm trying to make is he came into the UFC with these foundational high level abilities. And so if you have foundational high level abilities and you're 22, 23, oh my God, you've got your 20s to get good at some of these other things. And then he, he might have been a grappler first, but to me, he's a natural puncher. He's a natural striker. And so this is what I mean about being 27. Like, however good he was when he fought Volkanovsky, watch. he's um, win, or, win or lose, he is going to be better against Max Holloway. I, I have absolutely not one doubt about that um, because this guy is special. He's unique. He's different. O other fighters, for the most part, are not like this. So the funny thing is that he's only 27. He's not even in his physical prime, really, fighter's prime, right? We usually say that it uh, usually starts around 29, right? And just to imagine what the ceiling is, I mean, that is crazy. And, and I mean, I don't know if you know this or not, but his uh, older brother, Al Alexandre Topuria, is actually signed to the UFC. Uh, they signed him a couple of months ago, and uh, I think he's waiting for his debut. So he's going to be uh, competing at the bantamweight, uh, in the bantamweight division. So, Yeah, another uh, hammer division. And I'll just say this, though. Like, Tepori is 27. Um, I hope he keeps doing what he's been doing. Because if he ends up beating Max, and then they're talking about... I, I mean, I don't know if the UFC will do it, but if they... If they so, okay, so for example... Let's imagine a scenario. I don't know if this will happen, but let's just say. Let's say he knocks out Max, right? No one's ever done that. 
No one's ever done that at 145. No one's ever done that at 155. Let's say he's the first person to do that. Let's say it's devastating. They might make an Islam Makachev fight. And I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea, but the point I'm trying to make is he is ascending quickly enough where uh, the only real concern I have is not whether he'll ultimately be a very successful fighter when it's all said and done, but rather... Uh, if he gets pushed too quickly, could he get derailed? Could his progress get impeded? You know, there's all kinds of things that can happen when a guy is like overwhelmingly good. Um, again, I don't know if that will happen, but I almost hope that like the fight's a little bit tough. So he stays at 145 and then just kind of continues to get better. So that by the time he is 29 or 30, he will really be in his developmental prime. Um, that's the only thing I could think, think of that could get in his way. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know if you've had the time to catch up on the morning news already, but uh, apparently Alexander Volkanovsky, uh, there was a press conference in Australia. So they've officially announced that UFC is going back to Australia on February 9th. Uh, it's going to be UFC 312. And uh, Alex is obviously campaigning for uh, for a title fight potentially for a main event there because obviously it's understandable that he wants to headline an event uh, in his co home country, right? And so he said that no matter who the winner is, whether it's Max or whether it's Topuria, uh, he would like to face the winner next. What do you think about that? I don't mind the fight because at one point, Volkanovski was pound for pound number one in the world and obviously the featherweight champion. So Five like if anyone's defenses. in type. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it just, you know, arguably the best featherweight to ever do it. Right. I mean, so if, if he wants a rematch, I don't think that's crazy. The only thing you have to just take seriously is, you know, um, whether it's Max or it's Ilya, that fight could be brutal. That could be a brutal, brutal fight that goes with five rounds. It's a decision, but both guys just take an enormous amount of damage. Are they really going to be ready in, let's see, November, December, January, February? Maybe, maybe. But that could be, a, or if somebody tears a bicep or, in, you know, a knee or something, are they going to be ready for a turnaround like February? It, it, the point I'm making is if people are healthy enough, two thumbs up. But we have to see how the fight goes because, again, both Ilya and Max, these are not pushovers. These are very tough guys. We have to see how that goes. You mentioned the fight with Islam. Uh, I, I get that question asked a lot, actually. Like, one of the most popular questions that people usually ask, obviously because of, you know, the Dagestani wrestling school being so popular in the bantamweight division, we do have this kind of brewing conflict between Merab and Umar, but also, yeah, people just want to see for some reason Ilya go up. How likely do you think that fight is? And how do you kind of see it play out, I guess? Mm, that's a tough one. First of all, you know, I think highly of Ilya's abilities, but I don't want to look past Max Holloway. He's, you know, I want to, I cannot overstate this. Like, e even if, you know, for casual fans who might be watching, let's say Taporia goes in there and KOs him, people can be like, oh, how good was Max? Very good. Very good. Like, he is super legit. Like, the most, one of the most legit guys ever. Okay. So I don't want to look past him, but let's say we get to a point where there's interest in that fight and there's an opportunity to make it. Should they make it? I mean, here's the thing. We already know that Taporia's power translates up a weight class. Like, we already know that. And I do think he is just a vastly better striker than Islam. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But Islam is big for 155 and is defensively very careful and strong. You know, Taporia is good on the ground. I, I don't think he would necessarily get, like, super beat up. But uh, I think the only reason to make that is if if Islam can't get a fight at 155 or if there's an opening there and he's not going to go to 170, so let's just say he's otherwise available, and Taporia somehow polishes off Max and Volk again. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of work for him to do at 145. I understand that there's interest, but, like, dude, 145 is a tough division. Just to be champion there is really, really difficult. And, again, the other two guys behind him right now, Holloway and Max, these are two of the three best to ever do it in that weight class. So, like, I I think the push up at 155 is interesting, but premature. But also, like, if he does beat Max and Volk, I mean, do you really book him against someone like Diego Lopez or Movsa Revloev? Do you really see them as potential, you know, somebody who can give him trouble? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, there's a there, – people think, like, 
okay, so let's so let's let's imagine what you had just posited, which is he beats Max, let's say it's thorough, whatever that means, and he beats Volk again and it's thorough, whatever that means. Someone might say, Well, okay, if you can beat Volkanovsky and if you can beat Holloway, you know, what does Diego Lopez have for you? What does you know pick somebody else, Movsar have for you? And that's really the wrong way to look at it. The hardest thing to do in MMA by a million miles is to be a UFC champion and then defend as many times as possible. And everybody thinks that like the guy to beat the guy is going to be somebody tailor-made in a lab. You know what I mean? Like, oh, um, you know, the, the toughest guy with the best punching power and the best ground game. And sometimes it's that guy, but a lot of times it's really not. You can go back and look at Demetrius Johnson's maybe his toughest fight ever. You could maybe say John Dotson in the first one, but you could also say it was Tim Elliott. Tim Elliott was never predicted to be that guy. How about one of George St. Pierre's toughest fights? It was Matt Serra. You can go on and on. You know, uh, no one thought Chael Sonnen was going to do all that great against Anderson Silva, and he came that close to beating him. It's never the guys. That's not right. It's not always the guys that you think are like the toughest. It can be somebody who. Dude, when Diego Lopez gets a title shot, that's going to be the biggest day of his life. That's going to be that's going to be everything he's been sweating and bleeding and suffering for for maybe 20 plus years, right? That is not something that person is ever going to take lightly. And for Ilya, it's not his biggest night, and that mentally can mess up a guy. I've seen it a million times. So, I actually if he ends up beating both those guys, I'm going to tell you straight up, I'd rather see him fight Diego Lopez than Islam Makachev. And I think that's a super tough fight for him. And I would absolutely love to love to watch something like that. And honestly, I don't know. I just, I, I love watching these uh, champions just defeat, uh, defend their belt over and over again. I love what Easy has done at middleweight, you know. Yeah, he had this, you know, an attempt to go at to light heavyweight, but you know, never really felt like his heart was fully in it. You know, he always kind of kept looking back to middleweight. But yeah, it's just, again, when you realize just how tough it is, it's just, I mean, it's it's an amazing thing to see these, these guys do it over and over and over again. And yeah, light, I mean, lightweight will probably always be there, you know. Carlos Condit wasn't expected to do anything to George St. Pierre, and George won <laughs> that fight, but only after surviving a terrible head yes. kick. That almost ended the show. This is what I mean. Like the margin of error is so slim to be able to be like, I've defended this belt four times, five times, six times. That's an insane achievement. It's not as cool as having two belts for the photos, but like to me, the fact that Conor McGregor has belts in two weight classes, but no defenses of them kind of tells you which one is harder. And also Ilya already has apparently two belts, you know, to take <laughs> photos with. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I don't think he needs a third one. Uh, but Maybe yeah, so. yeah. Uh, but just if we for a second imagine that really that they, you know, bang it out in the first 10 seconds, let's say, and he knocks Max out, which is again, whether it happens, whether it doesn't, but let's just say that it happens. How big of a star do you think Max, not Max, but Ilya Tapuri is gonna become? Big, big. I don't know how he comes across in Georgian. Obviously, my English is fluent. It's my native language. My my Spanish is not great, but it's decent. He does not sound the same in English as he does in Spanish. Again, I can't even imagine how he sounds in Georgian. Yeah. But I can tell you there is a big difference. There's yeah. a massive difference between his English and his Spanish. And by the way, when I when I say that, I don't mean his English is bad. No, yeah. That's I not understand. what I mean. But you're you speak multiple languages. Do you feel like your personality is the same in every language? Hmm, De that depends. But I do understand what you mean with Ilya because it's so frustrating for me to watch his interviews in Georgian and then watch his interviews in English. Again, I don't speak Spanish, unfortunately, but I just realized that half of the stuff that he's saying in English are the references that I understand as somebody who speaks Georgian and who knows these references, but half of those things just fly over the you know regular American audience's head, which is kind of a shame, obviously. It's not anybody's fault really clearly but it's just yeah it's just a shame that they cannot really appreciate it it's the same in spanish to english again i'm not maybe not identical but it's the similar kind of dynamic where in spanish he is like smooth confident almost a little cold uh, yeah. but like in a good way you know what i mean whereas in english he, it's almost like he's trying a little too hard and so the fan base the english-speaking fan base to the best of my approximation has not they actually have a lot of issues with him because he hasn't like connected with them. And also like, well, Volk was coming off of the fight where he was kicked, uh, head kicked uh, 
you know, basically three months prior. There's still some questions there. The point I wanted to make was, I think the more they get to know him, the more that will change, the more he'll be comfortable in English with them. And it sounds counterintuitive, but I actually feel like it's going to do wonders for him. If he knocks out Max, 10 seconds or otherwise, um, beating someone's heroes at first makes everybody hate you. But you beat enough of them, and then you just become their hero. You become that guy that is simply undeniable. And to that point, again, if you eek by Max and the decision's controversial, it's going to be terrible for him. But if he has some like really authoritative win over Max, what can you say if you score back-to-back -back stoppages over Alex Volkanovsky and Max Holloway except for the king has arrived like you can't wait there's nothing there's no there's no place left to retreat to he would be in contention for one of the best pound for pound guys in the sport at that point you know what i mean like i think that the sport is currently right now desperate for some star power desperate for someone to take the game by the scruff of the neck in the absence of whatever connor's doing and Ilya, at least at a bare minimum has a grand opportunity because he has a super liked a super credentialed opponent in front of him you go out there and you dominate a guy like that again assuming that happens the world will be your oyster that is a statement for sure well i know that you're not a big fan of predictions but let's just say for the fun of it gun to your head october 27th in the morning we wake up who is the ufc featherweight champion of the world i think Ilya gets it done i think he gets it done now i am not confident that he puts max's lights out uh i if i had to again this is this is gun to the head scenario because if I was actually like, oh, you don't have to pick, then I just wouldn't. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, I, I just know you wouldn't. hate it. That's why I phrased it <laughs> carefully. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I hope everyone understands that. Like, I'm not good at predictions, and I no don't one like doing in MMA is good at predictions. <laughs> I know, and I feel like I feel like people don't understand that. People think that like, oh, there's people who are really good at them. Not, not yeah. really. No. Um, I do think that again, speaking about probabilities. There's a good chance Ilya wins. I think it's less likely that he stops Max, um, in part because he couldn't stop Josh Emmett, and he's much more hittable than Max. And so for that reason, I'm a little bit skeptical. I do think it is certainly um, something we should take seriously, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. So my prediction, gun to my head scenario, Ilya by decision. Okay, I'll take that. Well, uh, as much as I would like to talk about this fight for, I don't know, for three more years, I guess, uh, but I would also kind of want to get your opinion on the co-main event, if we can, real quickly. Uh, Rob Whitaker versus Hamza Chimaev, obviously. They are remaking that fight, which, again, is another fight that I really wanted to see for a long time. I don't know if you agree with this, but I just see this weird parallel between Max and Rob. Uh, both guys, former champions, both lost their belts to a CKB affiliated fighter. Both failed to regain that belt in the rematch. Obviously, Rob had that uh, strange loss to Dricus Duplessis, but I mean, how strange is it? Dricus is a champion now, but you know, uh, take it for what it is. Other than that, I mean, when you look at his career, he's been at the top of the middleweight division for almost a decade, which is just remarkable in itself. And on, this, on the other hand, you have this, this surging prospect in Hamza Shimaev, which is, I think, fair to say is quite untested at middleweight at this point. But yeah, just how do you see this fight playing out? It's like the most credentialed guy, not versus the least, but like the most wild card guy. You know what I mean? To your point, Rob has been a consistently excellent when win or lose you know he shows up he makes weight he's never in trouble more often than not he's getting his hand raised and not only that but against really good guys or even when he doesn't get his hand raised trick is fight notwithstanding but against izzy and like the rematch you know like that was that was very close you know he's just a very very skilled well-rounded highly experienced guy has been here a million times not phased by the moment has seen virtually every kind of style and then you look at Hamzat and you think, well, he's got a lot of things that you would think are very dangerous. Like he overwhelmed even Kamaru Usman in the grappling. And, you know, one of the things that 
really sets him apart from Habib when some when when people were first getting to know him was I I was like, dude, this guy's got punching power. And then you go back to the Gerald Mearshart fight, you know, and again the first Ikram Alaskarov fight, which he had outside of the UFC, you know, one punch KOing guys, you know. He just seems to have everything you would want, but he has been plagued by various illnesses over the course of his career. He's had visa issues because of his relationship to, we believe, Ramzan Kadyrov. Um, you know, he's just had a number of different difficulties that have kept him inconsistent out of the out of the cage, not really able to build off of, I should say, the initial momentum that he had. And even the Gilbert Burns fight, it was like Burns is obviously very, very good and pushed him very hard in that fight. But like, did you ever feel like as the fight wore on, oh, Hamzad is fighting as technically as he knows how to do. No, he sometimes just abandons what he knows just to bite down on the mouthpiece. And it's like, listen, if Hamzad shows up in a way where he's fighting in a disciplined, coordinated, prepared way, I think he might run over Robert Whitaker. However, <laughs> however, what has his prep been like? Is he going to bite down on the mouthpiece? Is he going to get hit with something and then just lose his discipline and his focus and then just abandon it? Or is he going to try to win a certain way to prove a point, right? Rather than just actually winning with what makes the most sense to get the win. He is such an unknown quantity in that way where Rob is the ultimate marker of discipline and Hamzat seems like the ultimate marker, marker of a lack of discipline. Um, and it's really hard to know what's coming or going. I tend to think that youth will win out here, probably. But if anyone's got questions, I understand that completely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess Rob, Robert Whitaker. I mean, that's that's a real test. That's a real test at middleweight for sure. If you can be, if you can beat him, you can win a title in that oh, weight yeah. class. That's, the, that's as easy as the West best I can say it. If you beat him, you can win a title there. There's no way, no better way to putting it, really. I don't want to hold you too long, but I do want to ask you one more question, if I may. Okay. Uh, so 2024 has been a remarkable year for Georgian sport. Where I'm leading with this is that at UFC 306, obviously, Mirab, Mirab Dwalashvili had a pretty impressive performance against Sean O'Malley. Uh, but I was a little bit surprised with the reaction to the win, to be honest. The reaction of MMA media, of most analysts that I've seen, is that it's overwhelmingly in Umar's favor. If I understand why you would think that, you know, Umar will win. I mean, he's a great fighter. I was very impressed with, uh, with his uh, performance against Corey Sandhagen. Uh, but it was just surprising to me how overwhelming that you know was honestly it was like pretty much 95 percent probably of people were like oh yeah yeah umar is the next champion it's you know it's not even this there's no not even a discussion which for me is a little bit weird because umar is still kind of untested at that division while mirab obviously had you know top level after top level after top level competition i mean the guy beat like what four champions for for god's sake so is there something i'm not getting <laughs> Uh, maybe I, I kind of understand some of the skepticism about Marab's ability to win. Um, I, I, sh well, I, I, I have questions too. I think it's probably the best way to put it. So it's not like Umar Nurmagomedov is like the craziest finisher ever. He goes to a lot of decisions too, but there's basically two problems that I think Marab has to contend with. One, if you've got a style that is basically uh, uh, one where you're not really a finisher and your whole premise of success is control position and work rate, you will eventually pay a big penalty for that. So, for example, I don't know what's going to happen when Bilal Muhammad fights Shavkat Rachmanov, but my people have asked me, like, isn't Bilal potentially with the wrestling, especially against how, he, how well he performed against Leon Edwards, couldn't he be a guy like uh, Rachmanov's kryptonite? And in certain ways, I do think that's the reality. However... You've got Rachmanov, 19 wins, 19 finishes. He's only ever beaten guys completely uh, and put them away. He's never gone to decision. The judges have been able to do this every time he fights. You cannot let a guy like that hang around for 25 minutes and think you're not going to suffer a big penalty. You will. You will. Like, that's just a reality, right? And I, th I feel like Umar is, excuse me, Marab is less prone in that way because he is very overwhelming. But as a general rule, as your career goes on, especially as you get older, if you let guys hang around in a fight, a fight is inherently chaotic and you cannot control for all the variables, it will backfire. That's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is, Umar, it's believed, and I want to use those words very clearly, it is believed that Umar will have a pretty strong ability to not only resist some of the wrestling attempts of Marab, but otherwise be able to scramble or dominate in the wrestling himself. 
or dominate's a strong word, but be in control. And then on top of it, he can actually strike really well. Whereas Marab does some decent in and out movement, but again, is not really a super significant striking threat. You're not super worried about that. You're worried about his single leg and then getting locked hands behind you. And then, you know, you're just, you're not going to be able to get back to your feet and then you lose the round. It seems like it, the, the feeling is that Nurmagomedov is uniquely situated to challenge that. Um, whether that is true, we shall see. But I do understand some of the skepticism about Marab's ability to beat a guy like that. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I get the points. All right, well, here we go. Uh, Luke, before I let you go, anything you would like to plug? Anything, um, any news interesting on your part? No, not really. Uh, you can just follow me on my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Luke Thomas. That's it. Yeah, Luke Thomas. For the, best, for the best breakdowns and best MMA coverage, as I've mentioned in the intro, for sure. Well, Luke, again, thank you so very much for doing this. I mean, I honestly, I could not think of a better card uh, and a better occasion to preview with you, honestly, because, again, I understand, I, I know mostly how you feel about this fight. I know how you feel about Ilya and his upper bound limit. Let's, let's put it like that. And yeah, it's been uh, honestly an honor and a privilege. I do have a feeling that the Georgian audience, this is probably not the last time they hear from you, uh, but I think it, this will do for now. Again, thank you so very much for doing this. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy Halloween and, you know, give Tuki a big hug from me. <laughs> I certainly will. Thank you for having me and uh, can't wait for UFC 308.